good evening. Thank you everyone who's uh, attending this uh, webinar uh, by Liber. This is another webinar that uh, the Liber team is uh, hosting. Uh, today we are going to explore the Europeana's Impact Playbook and uh, the whole title says Europeana's Impact Playbook, Measuring Impact in Your Library. Uh, my name is Yanis uh, Tsakonas. I'm acting director in the Library Information Center of University of Patras in Greece. I'm a chair of the Innovative Scholarly Communication Steering Committee of uh, Liber. And today we are hosting this uh, seminar with uh, uh, three uh, speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Julia Fallon, who is Senior Policy Advisor from Europeana. Marco Deniet uh, is a manager uh, and, uh, of research and education services in the Leiden University Library as well. He is deputy director there. Uh, I think I met Marco first time in 2016 when he first introduced the Europeana's playbook in uh, Glasgow in the International Symposium for uh, evaluating uh, uh, cultural uh, heritage. And our third speaker is David Todor, uh, head of digital access uh, section in the National Library of uh, Wales. Uh, as every uh, webinar that Liber hosts, uh, this is also uh, recorded and you will receive the link to the recording later today. We will, uh, we are uploading uh, every webinar and uh, you will have uh, access to this. Uh, slides are already on uh, Zenodo. You can see the chat box uh, for the link, but again, after uh, you can uh, have uh, the link to, to the slides, uh, there is one file for all uh, presentations. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And at the end, I will uh, address them to the speakers. Uh, as you know, Liber is uh, the biggest uh, research library network in uh, Europe. It was founded in 1971. Uh, we're having around uh, 440 libraries and uh, everything that we do uh, favors uh, open, which means the policies, tools and infrastructures uh, that we hope that uh, will reshape uh, research processes and mindsets uh, are uh, in favor of open. And we aim to enable outstanding research and to uh, the growth and sharing of uh, knowledge. Our vision in the, as uh, detailed in uh, uh, the strategy that we have for 2019-2022 is that we transform the research landscape by having uh, open access as uh, the main form of publishing, research infrastructures uh, that will be participatory, tailored and scaled to the needs of diverse, diverse disciplines, that research data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Digital skills will underpin a more open and transparent research lifecycle. And of course, cultural heritage, which is something that, uh, you know, uh, um, is the focus for today. Uh, the cultural heritage of tomorrow will be built on uh, today's digital information. Now, Europeana and Liber have uh, very strong ties. Liber is very uh, interested in Europeana and the developments in these uh, fields and uh, Liber participates uh, in the governing board uh, through, the through the representation of our vice uh, uh, president. Uh, if you have attended the Knowledge Cafe in Lille, you might have heard that uh, there is a strong interest, interest from our community. And uh, one of the attendees there in the Knowledge Cafe said that we should check the Europeana Impact Framework, uh, as told at the time, like uh, a metrics tool for digital cult cultural heritage activities. This was addressed in the, um, in the section for uh, innovative metrics. However, I think that this is an area that all these, uh, both these areas 
uh, overlap together uh, metrics and uh, uh, cultural heritage. I will not keep uh, uh, the mic for any longer. I will uh, give uh, the speech to Julia and uh, please feel free to send your questions in the attendees uh, chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gianni. Um, hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about the work we're doing at Europeana in the area of impact and talk to you a little bit about the Europeana playbook and the toolkit. And as Gianni referenced, the, the framework, it's all part of one big package for us. Um, and what I want to do in the next 10 minutes or so is just talk you through um, what the work, what our work in impact has brought to us, what some of the perspectives are that it's brought to us, um, as well as some of the core elements of the playbook to sort of help you see how it might also um, help you in your organizations before I pass over to Marco and Dafid to um, talk through their own experiences working with the playbook. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just take you back to that bigger picture that we all are kind of residing in as, as professionals in the cultural heritage sector. We are all trying to contribute towards um, the digitization of our cultural heritage. And um, we know from um, an enumerate report in 2017 that there's really just a small proportion of cultural heritage that's been digitized, around about 10%. When we look at what Europeana as an aggregator across Europe have, have been able to put together, the 58 million records that we um, currently share um, are, are then also a small proportion of that 10% that is digitized. But in terms of, of openness and reusability, we can see that only around about 23% of those 58 million records are actually available for free and open reuse. So we've got um, a very long way to go um, in terms of Europeana and our, not our network, but also across the sector. Um, and we also know from working in it that digitization is a really long game. It's not a quick process to work through. It takes a long time to digitize, to um, record, to publish, to share, to um, refine the digital objects and data that we share online. And one of the things that's been um, on our mind at Europeana for the past six or seven years has been this question of how do we know that we're making a difference? Um, we can look at the, the count of digital objects that we aggregate and publish. Um, in 10 years, we've doubled from, we've, we've more than doubled from, 20, from 25 million to 58 million objects. But, but so what is a question that our impact consultant, Sinza, often encourages us to ask. What does that really um, change? Um, um, and so in 2016, we started um, looking at um, implementing our own impact framework, which is based on um, a, a model developed by Simon Tanner. It's called the Balance Value Impact Framework for the Impact Assessment of Digital Resources in the Cultural Heritage Sector. It's a very long name. Um, and what we wanted to do is take this um, academic framework and put it into practice and look at how could we actually um, use ourselves as a guinea pig to um, to explore the impact that we were having um, so that we could build a resource for others in our network to use. And so we started looking at one of our um, most successful projects to date, which was um, European 1914-1918, which um, uh, collected examples from across Europe through a series of kind of interventions called collection days where people um, from local communities brought forward their digital objects, which um, represented um, or came from that a period of time during the First World War. And so people shared their stories and their recollections along with the digital object. And we ran um, our very first impact assessment on that. And what we wanted to see is we wanted to, we wanted to see whether people learned from this experience and, and kind of what they learned. And we recorded this in a, in a report. I think the link has just been shared. We also made a visual report which talks about all the different things that we learned from this. But one of the first things that we learned as an organization by thinking about impact um, was that this, um, this, this series of collection days wasn't quite what we expected. We, we collected loads of objects. It was really successful. It engaged lots and lots of people. But in terms of what really changed with the people who were involved, it wasn't quite what we expected because we asked people, what did, what did they um, expect to learn? How, how much did they expect to learn? 
And 69% of people said they expected to learn a lot on a scale of zero to 10. And when we asked them, what did they actually learn? We found that actually only 39% of people matched their expectations. And so there was a big gap between what people expected to learn and what they actually learned. And when we drilled down into that, we realized or we, we learned that um, there were two barriers to people learning from all the materials that have been surfaced through these collection days. Firstly, a lot of the objects were um, written objects and they needed transcribing before they could be useful in, a, in an interoperable environment. And secondly, they needed translation so that they could just simply be understood. And those were two barriers that we hadn't really fully appreciated until we'd asked these questions about expectations versus reality. Um, and before I go on, I just want to um, give you a definition of what I'm talking about when I mean impact. And this came from, um, from this work, because impact is a word that's used in lots of different ways. It's, loose, it's used very casually and loosely. But when we at European are talking about impact, we're talking about something very specific, um, which is um, the changes that occur for stakeholders, so the people you're trying to reach and interact with, or in society as a whole, as a result of our actions or activities. So a collection day is a good example of an action and activity. And that's important because we moved on to um, 2017 and we started doing more impact assessments um, using this model of looking at trying to look at what changes as a result of our actions and activities, not just the normal KPIs, how many people browsed our website, how many people downloaded a digital object, and so um, we started testing some um, assumptions we made about our role at Europeana. Uh, one of the probably most obvious ones, Gianni, you already talked a little bit about it, um, was that we, um, we expect to have an impact on how people perceive how important open data is. Um, but we never actually asked anyone. We don't actually ever record, are we actually having an impact or not? We sort of infer that by looking around at the um, the increase and the movement towards opening up collections. But a large part of that is not necessarily attributable towards us. And so in 2017, we actually asked some of our, our partners that question of, before you started working with Europeana, how important was open and open data and an open mindset to you? And after, how important was it? And we found that there was quite a big gap. So 25% of people said before they worked with Europeana, they thought the impact uh, sorry, they, they thought that open was important. And after or since working with Europeana, 50% of people found it, um, found open and openness important to incorporate in their work. So we could actually start to see that we are having um, an impact in our role as advocates for open data. And then finally, we move on to some of our most recent research which we started in 2017, again, around the concept of collection days, but this time focused on migration. Um, and we wanted, to, um, we wanted to learn whether the migration work that we did as part of a campaign, uh, which was actually our response to the European Year of Cultural Heritage, um, we wanted to see whether people actually started to change or have a, a stronger connection with their identity, just through learning more about migration or about connecting more with their migration history. We wanted to see if that happened because we have a general belief that if you have a stronger uh, sense of identity, you are a better participant in your community. And that actually that leads to stronger and better connected communities. So that really contributes to a more socially cohesive Europe, which is a big European Union goal. So we had some quite lofty ambitions. Um, and in the collection days um, that were run through the migration campaign, um, we ran 18 events over 12 countries. We collected just under 600 stories from just under 800 people. But that's not really the story. That's your standard sort of KPI metric. That just tells us what we achieved. I say what, what, just what we achieved. That was already quite a significant achievement that put a lot of, a lot of hard work was put towards. But what we actually achieved is we started to understand what sharing objects meant to people because we asked them, we asked them some tricky questions, some difficult questions about how they felt about sharing their stories, how they felt about stepping forward and sharing an object around their migration history to be put and digitized and put publicly online so that everyone could benefit from learning about these stories and their digital objects. 
And we started seeing some interesting results. So we found that 71% um, of people said that they found it easier to express themselves since sharing their story. And that relates to the fact that actually we also ask people, how often do you share your story, your migration story? And um, people said, well, actually, we don't really talk about this very much. So just a consequence of being able to talk about something that they hadn't shared before, they, they already found it easier to express themselves. We found that people reported higher levels of self-esteem and self-confidence after sharing their story. And that overall, they had a more positive view of their identity. So this gave us some of the building blocks towards having a stronger sense of identity. Um, it's, it's not complete. We're still kind of working on trying to understand how we can build this into, um, into this hypothesis we started out as, um, but it's a start. We also learned from this that people who participated really felt they wanted to go on and learn more. They wanted to learn more about their migration history, about migration as a topic, and they also wanted to connect more with their communities. So we started to understand a bit more about what changes from contributing their stories to the migration campaign. And these things have helped us build better products. It's helped us um, refine the things that we're doing. And it helps us focus on what we are trying to deliver and why. And this comes about through our work with the Impact Playbook. Um, so uh, the playbook, if you are new to it, is a set of tools and resources and methods that you can follow to start thinking about what impact and what changes your work has. It's um, it's uh, a methodology you can follow. It's like a recipe book. You can dip in and out. You can take a tool and use it in, in one environment, or you can follow the whole playbook step by step. It is something that is quite flexible. Um, and I think you'll hear some of the experiences in a minute, so I won't go on a bit too much about that. Um, at the moment, it's broken down in four phases. The current playbook really addresses the first phase, which is the design phase. So it's the, it's the point at which you're saying, I think I want to learn a little bit more about the impact that um, that my organization could have or the things that we do could have, but I don't know where to start. I'd like to have this conversation. And what the current playbook does is it gives you the tools and methods you need to have that conversation. The following phases will address um, how you actually assess, how you actually collect the data to assess the changes you want. So, so some of the statistics that we uh, showed you earlier. Also, how to narrate that, how to evaluate and, and um, pull out the most significant findings. And then how do you use that to evaluate your work um, internally? What can you learn from um, this, this research into impact? I mean, we learn every single time we run an impact assessment, we learn things that help us change and refine our products. Like that very first example I shared, I shared with you, which where, where we learned the value in also investing in transcription efforts. And so we... we um, run a lot now uh, trans, uh, transcribathons, which are events which transcribe the outcomes that come from the collection days, so that we help people learn more from those objects that are collected. Um, in practice, it's a series of really engaging workshops, and I can't stress that enough. It's really, really, it's a really engaging process. Um, it involves um, canvases, a bit of sticky tape, some post-it notes, and lots of exercises and tools where you bring people together, a wide group of stakeholders, to talk and to share ideas and to fill in canvases to try and bring out these, um, these ideas about what changes you want to bring about. Um, and the first, um, the first, the most significant tool that's in that um, which is the last thing I want to share with you before I, I'll pass you over to Marco, is a tool called the Change Pathway. And this for me, and, and for us, is probably the most significant tool that's in the playbook. It's the most um, uh, different tool that we share with you through the playbook. It's basically a way of, of structuring a conversation with your stakeholders to connect the things that you do, your activities, the outputs, the KPIs you deliver, with those changes that you want to bring about. So it looks at who your stakeholders are, who you're trying to connect with, what resources do you have to build activities, to run activities, and what do you want to get from it, what, your, what are your KPIs, as well as what changes in the long term. And it's broadly split into two sections. So on the left-hand side, 
there are a series of elements which are in within our control as an organization or a project or, or a group of people. Um, so the stakeholders, the resources, the activities and the outputs, those are all things we can determine who we want to reach, how much money we put towards it, what we do to reach them and what we actually get from that, what our targets are. And on the right hand side are the changes, the outcomes, the impact that the stakeholders, the people we want to reach, what they experience. And so this is played out over a series of time. The right hand side of this canvas is where you articulate in a workshop setting what changes do you expect your stakeholders to actually experience immediately in in two years time in three years time over whatever kind of time scale you are working towards and i'll just give you an example about how that breaks down um, in one of our core areas of working which is in education um, where we looked at what could the migration campaign bring to a teacher and so we we decided that we were talking about what a history and social sciences teacher and we wanted to see what really what could they how could they benefit from working with us and, and the data that we collect through the migration campaign either through collection days or working with cultural heritage institutes to surface more cultural heritage data um, and so looking at the things that are within our control um, we we ran mainly a series of activities which enabled us to collaborate with teachers to create lesson plans um, so that that would then deliver um, educational resources, um, so slide decks and materials, um, which used open data. And so that led to an increase in the number of educational resources being developed using European material and also the increase of open data being used in education. But again, those are very sort of fairly stock KPIs for an organization like us. What's not a standard sort of KPI is looking at what changes, which is best represented on the right hand side of the canvas, which is looking at how people felt, what changes people experienced from this, um, th this process. And so um, when we're looking at the changes, we have to look at what changed for the teacher. But because the teacher works with students, we also wanted to understand what changed for the students. And so we looked at, we hypothesized that actually um, in the engagement level with students would go up because the teacher is delivering better resources that are more engaging, that are more relevant. There'd be an increase in awareness of the relevance of, of um, migration history and an increase in the sort of level of satisfaction and perception of quality in the classes. And overall, students would be therefore more open to cultural diversity. Now, this is just, this is one um, hypothesis that comes from a series that are developed through this workshop. It's not the only one we work to, it's just one example that we could go on to test if we wanted to. Okay, so um, before I hand over, I just want to um, bring that all together and say that all of these tools and resources are available on our website, which is at the bottom of the screen, impact.tools. There you can download the impact playbook, which is the, the walkthrough methodology, the the explanation of what conversations do you need to have in what order and why and how. You can also download the tools and resources, so the slide decks and the canvases and the spreadsheets that you need to support this journey through the playbook. And you can read the case studies, the examples of other people, including ourselves, who have used the playbook to develop um, their impact thinking in their organization. Um, and you can also join the impact community, which is a growing community um, of, of curious and keen digital cultural heritage professionals, people wanting to explore their own impact or sometimes being experts in that and wanting to help share their own knowledge. And together, all these resources, the case studies, the, the tools, the playbook and the community, we refer to as a toolkit. So if you're looking to explore your own impact you we, we would invite you to come to impact.tools and have a look around and see what you can learn and what you can find in our toolkit that might be useful to you okay i'm going to hand over to marco now thank you very much for listening hi uh, thank you julia this is marco hello everybody thank you for joining and attending this uh, webinar um what i intend to do is uh, show some of the examples that we've done at the university library in Leiden uh, to make a better understanding of what impact actually means. So uh, I call this um, impact awareness. What I'm about to show you is not 
how we do an impact assessment in practice, but how uh, among my colleagues, we can have a better understanding what impact means. And as Julia said, impact has quite a specific meaning and um, a word like impact and output and outcome, they're quite fashionable kinds of words, but what do we actually mean with them? And also, um, if we want to say in services development, we want to be user driven or we want to, we want to put the user at the heart of our services. What does that actually mean? And what I'm about to show you is how the playbook helped us get a better understanding of, of, of uh, putting the user at the heart of our services. So that was a, 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 an important goal of the workshop that I had last year here in, uh, in Leiden to create a shared understanding among my colleagues about impact, also familiarize themselves with the tools of the playbook. Um, what was nice was that we didn't only talk about users, but, uh, and I will show you that in a minute, we also invited some super users of our digital collections to attend the workshop. Uh, and we built a case around that to, um, to have a good conversation about what impact means for these users. And finally, the result of the workshop was um, a, a baseline for a case study in the context of the European Impact Task Force. So um, first about that shared understanding and what it means uh, to put, oops, sorry, this one too far, to put the user at the heart of your services. Now for us as libraries with cultural heritage collections, I think that's quite a difficult proposition. Um, and I'll try to explain this with these, with these images. Um, uh, it's easy to say we put the user first, but the fact is that we cannot really do this in many, uh, many um, uh, occasions, because sometimes we have uh, legal obligations for curating our collections, or uh, we, ha we have um, uh, fantastic ways to show and share our collections. Um, so for our type of organizations, it's often that the users follow the data. We put the data first, we put the collections first, we show them on, on the web or in, in portals or on other uh, online services. Uh, and we hope that users will make use of them, but we don't really know how they use them and how the impact is on those users. You might say, we want to change that. We want to really put the, the user first but I think this is the model that we see at the big tech companies. That's the bottom line. That's, if you look at services like Google, Google is not really that interested anymore in the quality of the content that they provide through the search engine. They're interested in the users and how they use the data in their search engines. So they collect data on the user. Um, I just show you this to, to, show, uh, to, uh, to explain the, the difficult situation that we have as curators of digital heritage collections uh, with our users. We can never be fully user-driven, at least that's my opinion. However, having said that, the impact tools from Europeana help us get a better understanding of um, what the users are. And this is where our super user comes into play. His name is Erik Kwakkel. He was a professor here in Leiden. Um, that was when we did the workshop last year. He has now moved to Vancouver in Canada. Um, but he was a very uh, 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 interested uh, new type of researcher making full use of digital facilities that we provided as a library. His speciality is um, medieval literature and medieval books. And he has um, many, many followers on his social media. And what we are interested in is to understand how does the work that we do as a library to digitize our collections, how does that impact his work as a professor? in teaching, but also in publishing, for instance. And there were two uh, types of um, impact that we wanted to measure. And this is also part of the toolkit that Europeana provides. On the one hand, we wanted to understand the, say, the economic impact of our digitization on, on his work. And we wanted to assess the social and cultural impact that we have, uh, for instance, on his students or his fellow researchers. And I'll just show you a brief example of both. So for instance, this could be the economic impact. Um, uh, we could save him reproduction costs because he can use it for free downloads from our website. There's a lot of uh, time saved by him um, because he can do, do it in his own time uh, at his own place 24-7. Um, uh, publishing costs, traveling costs, those are all 
factors that may be impacted when he uses our, uh, our, our collections. I think uh, also interesting is the social impact and the cultural impact. And for this, it's very important to understand that the impact is not necessarily our direct impact as a library, because uh, our users also act as an intermediary to our collections. So this is what happened with Eric, because he uses our collections on um, his social media. He has a wider outreach to students, for instance, uh, or to other researchers in his field, uh, or general uh, audience who have an interest in, in what he is doing. Uh, and they, not, they don't necessarily follow our social media of the library, but they follow Eric. And I'll show you what a difference that can be. For instance, uh, oops, on uh, uh, Eric's Twitter account has over 20,000 followers. Our library, we have over uh, 3,600 followers. So as you can see, the attractiveness of uh, someone who works with the collection and distributes the information that we provide by digitizing our collections to his own followers, that's a major impact. So the impact is not just from us as an organization, but it's also an indirect impact from the people who make use of our services and have their own uh, impacts in their followers. I think this is a very interesting concept that we dived into into the workshop. Um, now, what I'm um, uh, uh, going to share with you here is not necessarily the outcome of that impact assessment that we did with Eric. Uh, and what I would like to show you is how we worked with our colleagues in our workshop to create that awareness of the importance of our users and understanding our users. Um, and I do that in the hope that you will also um, organize a similar workshop in your own organization. And the, the toolkit from Europeana, uh, I hope you will find it attractive. Uh, and we did enjoy it and I will share some lessons learned in my presentation with you about that. So the workshop that we did, uh, we had 12 participants, two uh, were colleagues from uh, from Eric, and we had 10 staff members here at the library from all kinds of departments, as you can see. So it's not just special collections. We also invited uh, um, the people from who, who do the direct services in, uh, at the desk. And we worked in subgroups um, uh, uh, with the tools that the, that the European Playbook provides. And I will take you a bit through those Playbook tools now. So the first tool, um, this is something that um, Julia didn't show you yet. That's the empathy map. And I think this is a very interesting tool um, to start using in the workshop. It's really helping us as professionals to look at ourselves through the eyes of our uh, stakeholders. We often think that we know what the user wants. We often think that the user wants more or less the same thing that we want as professionals. but we're not really sure if that is the case. And what we see, if we, if you're, for instance, in service design, there's a whole project of creating a service, and then somewhere at the end, the users come in and they can test and they can comment, and then you improve something. Uh, we believe very strongly in a much closer collaboration with the users and get them involved very early on in in the process because I think that will create better services for uh, for the users. So the empathy map. This is the tool that's in the Europeana playbook. Uh, helps you to think and feel and see and say and do and hear how a user looks at your services and at your organization or at your team. And it helps you to analyze you know, what works well from them in the things that you do and what doesn't really work well for them. And the result, and I'm not going to share the details, it's also written in Dutch, um, but this is, as you can see, a good team efforts of the, 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 the subgroup that worked with the playbook tool and they ask questions and they find uh, uh, issues that we don't necessarily talk about as colleagues because we have a, a certain way of looking at the collections that we have and the services that we provide. And um, uh, this is a very good way as a start of impact assessment to really think about what does the user really want and how do they perceive what, what we try to achieve as a library? Now, um, the second tool that we used as a, as, a, as a sequel to the empathy map 
is the change pathway. This was already introduced for you uh, shortly by Julia. And I will show you some examples of how we uh, put it into practice in our, uh, in our workshop. And I will give you some tips at what we, um, at how we used it. I think the most important tip that I can give you is um, start at the right end of the pathway. Now this was really challenging for my colleagues because starting at the left side, you know, with the resources that you have, the people and the money and the plans and the ideas that we have and the activities, that's our daily work and that's our usual starting point. But in the workshop, we turn it around and we said, why don't you try to look at the impact you want to have on your user and try working your way back from that. What do you actually need to do? What are the activities that you need to do? And what's the output that you need to provide to come to that kind of outcome and impact in, uh, in the long term? And um, that was really very difficult for my colleagues to, to have that kind of reasoning thinking from the user. So I think that was a very good lesson learned. Another important element, which is also in, uh, in the change pathway in the playbook that's explained in the playbook, is be aware of your own accountability. Um, maybe some of the changes of the impact um, uh, wasn't necessarily a result from the things that you've done. Julia also mentioned that that impact can be used quite loosely. You know, if you write a project proposal, you're often asked to write about the impact. And sometimes it's just something that you project. It's not necessarily the impact that is perceived by your, uh, by the people that you want to reach in through your services or through your projects. So a very important question is, can you assess what is really your responsibility? Uh, and I think that's what we call the accountability line. So uh, somewhere, in the, those outcomes, um, you don't work as a library individually. You work. We often work in a collective, but there are also this, uh, cultural heritage collections in museums or in archives. Um, there's there are a lot of private owners of cultural heritage collections. So the way that people engage with historical objects is not necessarily because the way that you provide your services. There are many different ways that people can interact with cultural heritage. So this accountability line, I think, is a very good way to think about yourself and about the, 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 um, the effect that you have on, uh, on your users. Now, and the third uh, tip I can give you is apply, this is also a tool from the playbook, the strategic perspectives. And there are four perspectives that are explained in the playbook. Um, because we are cultural organizations, we often think about the social uh, elements of the work that we do. We want to educate people. We want to have them um, have a good understanding of history in the national or a local or an international context. But there are other, other elements that we are a player in, like in, there's an economic factor in the work that we do. There's an organizational uh, factor in the work that we do. Uh, we are in, engaged in innovation through digitization. Um, and if you also have this perspective uh, brought into the change pathway, um, um, you will understand that some of the impact that you have may be different, like I mentioned with Eric. Maybe we, it, we help him save money because he doesn't have to travel, uh, because he can do it from his own desk in his office or at home. And finally, and this is um, maybe uh, a bit of a silly one, but always use a fresh pair of eyes. So what we did is swap the pathways between the groups and comment on each other because these groups can have a specific dynamic within the group and it can be helpful to uh, ask another group to have a look at the outcomes that you had. So this is the result of one of the results that we had and you can see the different colors and, uh, and the different uh, discussions that we had um, uh, um, uh, among the colleagues. And um, as you can see at the, at the top, um, uh, my colleagues, completely isolated the social cultural perspective. And again, it was an eye opener for them to think that the services that we have may have an economic impact. Okay, um, and the third, uh, uh, the final part of the workshop that we did was we also, I also asked my colleagues, and this is also again in the playbook, try to think of indicators, how to measure the impact that you want to achieve or that you that is part of your, the mission of your organization. And this is just an example. You can see that uh, uh, numbers of items. This is also quite difficult to, to get. Talking about impact in generic words 
uh, and what we want to achieve and aspire, I think that's um, uh, quite close to our heart. But if you sit down to the nitty gritty part of understanding impact and how do you actually assess that the impact has taken place and to what degree it has taken place, I think finding good indicators is quite difficult. And I also believe that this is something that we shouldn't do on our own. But, and this is one of the reasons why I support Europeana and the task force, because they help the conversation uh, in defining these indicators. Okay, so the final slide before I hand over to David. Um, th those are the lessons learned uh, from our workshop. And I present them here in the hope that you will find inspired to do a similar workshop in your own organization. Um, so my colleagues were very positive about the tools. They find them very um, helpful to get the discussions going in the, in the subgroups uh, for both the empathy map and the change pathway. As I mentioned earlier, beginning at the right end of the pathway, that was really an eye opener. Uh, very difficult to think through, but really an eye opener to look at yourself uh, with a critical mind. Um, the social cultural perspective was quite dominant in, in our workshop, so we tried to change that as well. Indicators were difficult to really assess. Uh, and funnily enough, maybe we did a four hour workshop. It wasn't enough. My colleagues were so enthusiastic about talking that we wanted really more time. We needed actually more time um, to finish the, uh, the workshop. And what I can recommend to you, uh, you see that my presentation is in the Europeana style, not in the style of the university library. Uh, the European task for Impact Task Force has published uh, a slide deck in PowerPoint, which is available online. And that's very convenient if you want to prepare such a workshop. So I would say, just do it, do your own workshop. Okay, I think I will now hand over to Duffy. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm David from the National Library of Wales. Um, I'm going to be talking about two uses that we've made of um, the Impact Playbook here at the library. Um, but before then, I'll, I'll give you some background. It was through my interest in the open access movement that I um, became interested in the discussion, also the need for a discussion around impact, um, in that um, as, as an advocate of open access, I felt and I believed that we were making a difference by opening up collections for free reuse, um, but found it very difficult to, to provide evidence of that. Um, of that value that was being generated um, once they were available for use. And I was given an opportunity to attend the European event hosted by the EU presidency in Estonia in October 2017. And that was my first introduction to the playbook. Um, I hadn't, I wasn't involved at all in creating the playbook um, and the team who have worked on it have made a brilliant job. Um, and I was uh, introduced to it. I was involved in workshops using it and I immediately saw the potential not only um, in relation to open access and some of the questions that I had, but in um, planning and delivering and evaluating a range of the library's activities. So I returned to Wales. Um, we're looking for an opportunity to use the Impact Playbook. Um, and the first of those, the first of the two, was um, a community transcribathon that was being held uh, the following week with a local family history society. The National Library of Wales had developed a new platform for delivering crowdsourcing projects. And this workshop was going to be the very first use of that platform for community transcription. So I saw this as my opportunity to run a workshop before that event um, using some of the tools that um, had been introduced to me uh, in Estonia. What I found during that workshop is how useful the playbook was in the first place for defining a project. So we sat down and began really by discussing the strategic perspective and the very, um, all, all of us have been involved or in, in some connection with the, the work on this crowdsourcing platform. Um, but it was good to have that discussion a week ahead of the first workshop to, to ask really that question, why are we doing this? What are the drivers? Um, what are the both the strategic and operational aspects of the projects from the library's point of view? Um, it gave us a better understanding of what we were doing, why we were doing it. Um, it helped form that consensus. And I'd emphasize that working with a playbook, um, the, the process that you go through in these workshops is, um, 
is as important as the product itself at the end. Um, so it's about understanding what, what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and hopefully being able to demonstrate the difference that we've made as a result of that, as a result of that activity. Um, the second thing that we did was we identified the stakeholders. Um, and we already knew for this event that we were working with this local family histories group. But using the empathy map that you saw from Marco, um, it um, made us look at the activity from the participants' perspective. Um, when we work on a technical application, the focus is so much on, on the tool itself. Um, it can often be on the, the collection. And there was something refreshing about coming at this and looking at it from a participant's point of view and understanding how they would benefit, what change would be, um, would be uh, for them as a result of being involved in, in the, the transcribathon. And then lastly, we looked at the change pathway itself. Um, we had our activity uh, defined, we had our stakeholders, we had an idea of the change um, that it would bring for those who are going to be involved in the transcribathon. Um, I feel um, that it was quite a challenge for us to distinguish between outputs and outcomes. And one of the great things about working on the change pathway, and we had to return to the definition of impact time after time to remind ourselves that it's really about change for the stakeholder and keeping our focus on that. So um, in that first activity, the playbook helped us to focus on the participant and the impact rather than the tool, the collection and the outputs. The play playbook um, was found to be a useful tool for planning projects in general. Um, it creates a space for discussing the core elements of a project, and it helps to establish a common understanding of the aims and activities. And it's a great um, tool for team building, um, building that sense of, of working together towards a, a specific uh, aim. So that was our first, the first of the two activities that I'll be, um, that I'll be uh, presenting today. The second was um, a much larger project. This is last year we were invited to produce a case study for the playbook or based on our use of the playbook. And uh, we used it to plan a Wikimedia based project and to report on its impact. Um, we've had a very successful Wikimedia residency here at the National Library of Wales, uh, which began in 2015. And um, as a result of the success of that residency, the it's now become a core activity, a core funded activity by the library um, since 2017 with the appointment of, of Jason Evans as a national Wikimedia. And we decided um, that the case study would be based on a project called Wikipobble. Wikipobble is, is Welsh for wiki people. Um, the National Library of Wales had shared nearly 5,000 portraits from the Welsh portrait collection on Wikicommons along with open data associated with the Dictionary of Welsh Biography. And we were seeking funding and looking to develop activities that would uh, be based on that data, that would involve engagement with certain groups um, based on, on the portraits and the metadata. In the kickoff workshop, staff considered the library's own strategic priorities again and operational targets so we had that that um, we put it in that context and using the strategic perspectives that are in the playbook helped to stim stimulate that discussion marco mentioned the social the economic the innovation and the the organizational the operational perspectives and we then um, having had that discussion and, and clarity from the library's perspective about why we were approaching this activity we then listed potential stakeholders and we had a long list um, which needed to be turned into smaller groups then um, so our groups or our key stakeholders were um, education the creative industries and another group that we called community. Um, when we were talking about community, we were thinking of those, the community of Wikimedians who were always um, very enthusiastic about new Wiki projects. And that was one that we were looking to, to, to bring in and be involved in this work as well. And we designed our activities further down the line based on those three stakeholder communities. The fourth stakeholder was the potential funder, and that was the um, Welsh language units of the Welsh government. Um, and so, 
when we came to designing the change pathways, we would uh, look at aligning the um, the uh, outcomes for each stakeholder group, also with the government as a funding, um, as, a, as a stakeholder funder, um, as it were. But before then, we did the empathy maps for each of those groups. We looked at pains and gains. Um, and then we transferred what we, we summarized the pains and the gains as a, an offer, as it were, to the stakeholder groups to summarize what we were going to be providing for them through this particular activity. And those became the impacts for those um, stakeholder groups. Um, from there, then, we developed change pathways. Uh, those developed into, um, we looked at then as, as measurements and how the, what tools would be used to, to measure. Um, and that covered a range of um, methods, which included questionnaires and feedback, some of the wiki tools that are available to us. But what was good was that we started with looking at what exactly was the, um, what was the impact that we were trying to deliver? What were the changes that we were looking to identify and we were hoping for and how those could be measured? Um, you can find the full report on the Bitly link that I've put at the bottom of this slide. Um, I should also mention that um, there was a link on the other on the previous slide if you would like to um, read about our experiences with the our first experiences with the Impact Playbook. Very briefly, here are the next steps for us um, at the National Library of Wales. What I'd like to do is embed the methodology across NLW activities. Um, that's something that I'm keen to do. I'd also, also like to gain more experience of of, of the measurement aspects. Um, as uh, Julia mentioned right at the beginning. This is we the, the design phase has been published. Um, I'd like to learn more about assessing and narrating. We'd also like to raise awareness of the playbook within the sector in Wales. I've been delivering presentations to um, librarians. I'll be giving present a presentation to archivists soon. So that's something that we would like to do. And also, um, I'm also involved with the Europeana Impact Community, so on the steering group for the impact community. Um, so we're looking to build that international community of impact practitioners who use these tools so that we can share experiences and learn from each other. So sorry, a very rushed end, but uh, hopefully there's still time for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Julia and Marco, of course, for your presentations. Um, any questions? We have to move to questions shortly, like as Friedel says. Uh, we already have one. It's not um, uh, pre, uh, available to to the chat, but um, uh, there is a question uh, from an attendee that uh, says that they are planning an impact assessment in uh, Louvain, and uh, they are wondering uh, about the resources that this would need. Uh, and this, of course, requires uh, time, people uh, for preparation and implementation. And uh, more generic, how this would uh, weave into the general operations. I think that this is better to be answered by Marco. Marco? Yeah, all right. That's a, indeed a very good question. Um, and a very understandable one. I think it depends uh, on what kind of workshop you want to do. If you want to do a full impact assessment like what David is doing, then it will be a series of workshops. It will not be just be a one-off meeting. Uh, I think that's all explained in the playbook. They, they take you by the hand if you want to uh, and plan for a series of events. You need to think, for instance, about the role of managers in the process and you need to think about specialists and the role of the user. So maybe um, uh, you need different people uh, at different times around the table. Um, so I think that takes a, a bit more planning. I don't think you can take it lightly, uh, a full impact assessment. If you want to do a workshop like I did, which is more about impact awareness, if you are already familiar with the tools uh, in the playbook, it won't take you just probably more than a couple of hours. Uh, I've customized the slide deck from Europeana. Uh, you have to print some of the materials. Um, uh, uh, so I think it took me about an afternoon to prepare for our workshop. Um, but if you feel uncomfortable yet with the tools from the playbook and you need to familiarize yourself with it, it probably take a bit more time um, uh, to do so. 
Um, okay, uh, as as long as we wait for other questions to to arrive, could I ask Julia something? I mean, you said that um, impact is quite specific uh, concept. Do you think that uh, you know in different languages or different uh, cultures, uh, like we have many in Europe? Uh, maybe you know different in the interpretations of this concept could this affect uh, the implementation of the uh, the entire uh, the, the playbook and the entire framework that's a really good question actually um i think yes a little bit um so our experience so far is that the playbook is available in english that's how we have prepared it but it has also been translated into polish um, which if you register for the playbook, if you download it, will ask you to fill in a form and you have the option of selecting the language that you want. We'd also welcome anyone else wanting to, to translate it into their own languages. As part of that translation process, we learned that actually um, in Polish, impact doesn't really mean the same thing. And some of the terminology we use needed a little bit more explanation. Um, and so we were able to address that by translating the playbook. Um, so that the tools were available in local languages. That's something I'd love to work on more um, with any partners who are interested in doing that as a means to exploring a little bit more. You can also read this. You can also read about how the translation of the playbook enabled um, Maya to um, to use it um, in her workshops uh, throughout the aggregate throughout the cultural heritage sector um, in Poland. Um, because for her it was very much a means to an end. She couldn't use it until it had been translated, so they translated it. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is part of the work that the community, the European Impact Community, also has, right? Um, yeah, I would say so, yeah. Um, <laughs> we actually um, just published um, an article yesterday, uh, which we'll be promoting um, in the coming week, which lays out the impact community and the chairs and the three objectives of the community in 2019 which is to support the development of the toolkit, um, to help and support the communication of the importance and value of, of measuring and understanding impact, um, and also to support practitioners, because um, whilst we at Europeana, were the, we, we were the first movers because we developed this approach, we've also been trying to support our partners in developing it. And now our partners like Marco and Dafid want to also help other people learn how to do this and to take those first steps. And so that's a real um, a real focus for the community. Part of that is definitely translating it into local languages to help smooth the sort of the understanding and the, the interpretation across Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I I don't see any questions coming, so um, I would like to ask something, David, mm -hmm. um, who is working in a national library. And uh, many national libraries have, you know, this uh, role of coordination of the cultural heritage institutions. They have, you know, aggregating uh, responsibilities and so on. Do you think that the national libraries or any other, you know, aggregating entities, to, to say so, uh, are sort of responsible to, promo to promote the, uh, the wide use of these tools uh, in the cultural heritage section of their countries? Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's certainly a role that I see, see for us in, in Wales. Um, I mentioned at the end of the presentation that um, opportunities have, have come up to present the methodology, to present the playbook to uh, at conferences for librarians and archivists here in Wales. And um, being uh, national institutions, I think it offers, um, it, it puts it puts the, th this discussion and this resource on, on a good platform to be uh, presenting that message. Um, it, it happens that that, that um, this was something that we really saw the need for for, for us as an organization as well anyway. Um, and it's just great to be able to, to share our experiences. And I think um, one, as, a, as I also mentioned, I think it's, it's, it's a learning process and I still very feel very much that we have a great deal to learn here, and it's really by doing um, and sharing with others that we're going to develop that understanding of impact, and and it will benefit all libraries, um, hopefully in the end. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, 
the very last minute. Uh, does anyone has uh, experience with making impact assessment part of a pr process so that it may be applied to many activities in the realm of digital cultural heritage? What is the best way to start? Um, maybe Julia? Yes, please, Julia. Uh, sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Um, yes, uh, we actually um, use this as part of the design process for our products. We don't use it in, in every product or service we develop, um, but we use it to help shape our products when we're in the very early stages. And that has been really, really interesting. So I can recommend that as a way to embedding it in some of your internal processes. Great. So I think uh, now that we reached one hour, it's time to call it an end. I would like to thank uh, very much uh, all of the attendees. Uh, as Friedel said, we have a in very international uh, audience uh, today. Thank you all of, uh, thank you uh, for attending uh, this uh, webinar. Also, I would like to thank uh, our presenters, Julia and Marco and David, it was uh, uh, a, a, a very enlightening uh, webinar as uh, always and very interesting because everything that comes from Europeana is uh, highly interesting. Uh, thank you very much. We hope we'll see you again in another webinar. And of course, don't forget that we have in a couple of weeks the Liber Annual Conference in Dublin. We hope to see you there and uh, please uh, come meet us. Uh, let's discuss about those issues. We have a digital humanities working group. We have a innovative metrics working group. These are all very relevant. Uh, so see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for the attention. Thank you. Bye-bye.